Friends, every prayer service in Judaism contains the following phrase, which is from the Amidah, and we've said it a million times. It says, Eloheinu v'elohei avoteinu v'imoteinu Elohei Avraham, Elohei Yitzchak v'elohei Yaakov. And now today it says, Elohei Sarah, Elohei Rivka, Elohei Leah. So it is that statement that says, we, we stand here, we praise God, the God of our ancestors, the Avot and the Imahot, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel and Leah. So for the time being, let's forget the egalitarian addition, which is so necessary, but let's focus in on the most traditional part of this phrase, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. So here's the problem. How great are these patriarchs? How great were these three people? For Abraham, it's self-evident. He was great. He was the founder of our people. He was the brave one willing to take the journey to the unknown. He's the first monotheistic theologian. For Jacob, it's also self-evident. He's brave, he's ingenious, he's sly. He's the father of the 12 tribes. But what about Isaac, the second patriarch? Adin Steinzelt, the great Talmudist and Kabbalist and one of the great rabbinic geniuses of the 21st century, in writing about Isaac's place in the Torah's narrative, he, he says the following, Isaac is one of the most enigmatic characters in the Bible. The story about Isaac is itself is not long. It comprises but a few concise fragments. And the personality of Isaac that emerges in all of them is strangely puzzling. Not that he ever does anything out of the ordinary. And this is one of the worst compliments in the history of, uh, of Torah co commentary. It's that it is rather the very nature of his actions, which are more like non-actions a doing that consists of renunciation of doing anything. So what he's basically saying is Isaac didn't do anything. So what it says is as Isaac lived, Isaac's life was just about being the son of Abraham. And Steinzoltz writes, most of the deeds connected with Isaac's name were actually accomplished by other people. And what little he did on his own seems no more than a repetition with light variations of what his father had, 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 that his father had done. I, you know, when I was thinking about this message, I just couldn't help thinking about the Donald Trump and his children. <laughs> They're the second generation. What are they? But that has nothing to do with that, the sermon. I just couldn't. It's one of my stream of consciousness that I just had to share with you because I would think, you know, Donald Trump Jr., the second generation. That's interesting. In any case, we don't want to be unkind to Isaac, but we should tell the truth. He's not charismatic like his father. He was not creative. He was not adventurous. He doesn't even leave the land of Israel. He's not a great military leader. He avoids confrontation with the Philistines. He seems to be rather an ineffectual father and husband. But nevertheless, our tradition recognizes him as a pivotal figure, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Our tradition recognizes him as a pivotal figure, and I think the Torah gives us a hint of why that's the case. In Genesis 26, two verses, I'm, I'm going to read them to you. It says, so Isaac departed from there and encamped in the Vadi of Gerar where he settled. And Isaac dug anew the wells of which had been dug in the days of Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham's death. He gave them the same names that his father had given them. What a real, really strange detail to give us about Isaac. Isaac did not dig new wells. He reclaimed old wells. 
the wells already dug by his father. Ramban, the great 13th century biblical commentator, remarked, there would seem to be no benefit nor any great honor to Isaac in that he and his father did identical things. His reclaiming the wells of his father, however, is an indication of his greatness. Let's put it in Jewish terms, and it makes absolutely, absolutely good sense. His loyalty to Jewish values and practices in Judaism is his significance. He holds on. His greatness is that in the shadow of his father, he understood that his role was to preserve and not neglect Jewish tradition. He didn't create the tradition, but if he didn't carry it on, there would be no tradition. That's what at stake in the binding of Isaac when God says to Isaac, slaughter your, God says to Abraham, slaughter your son Isaac. If Isaac is dead, there is no, there is no future. And everything that God had promised Abraham, down the tubes. Chizkuni, another 13th century commentator, remarked that giving the wells the same names was laudable deed, for these names demonstrate and prove that the wells entered his possessions from the legacy of his father. Friends, in every generation, we Jews seem to confront the challenge of continuity. Will the next generation continue it? And of course, now we are faced with the challenges that it appears that many people don't want the Jews to continue. They want us dead or, or pushed into the Mediterranean, or they want to intimidate us. Welcome to University Life 2023. But I don't want to talk about that tonight. The great issue for me is, will the next generation care about Judaism as much as the generation before? And I'm not talking about locks and bagels on Sunday morning. Will assimilation dissolve us? Will Jewish ignorance demoralize us? Will Jewish communal politics alienate us? Will the intolerance of one Jew for another turn us off? Do we have enough Jewish, soul, do we have enough Jewish souls who are committed to being an Isaac? to saying I'm willing to make sacrifices, to use my energy and my time and resources to carry on. Are we willing to redig the wells? Judaism is, such, is so much about preservation and recovery. Are we willing to redig the wells? Now on this Shabbat, I'm incredibly optimistic because there is a factor of Jewish continuity that we must recognize and also celebrate, especially tonight. 17% of American Jews say that they were raised in another religion. More people are converting today than ever before. I'm weekly getting emails and phone calls from people who want to become Jewish, and I'm not exaggerating. I got a phone call from Istanbul. How they got to me in Kansas City, I have no idea. Um, someone must have given them the wrong number. But in any case, now why do people seek to become part of our people? They are spiritual seekers. They come from all races, religions, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientations. Now people are converting to Judaism because they have a passion for it. They are not the Isaacs who, who are redigging wells. These are incredible people who have decided to dig their own wells. They are converting for the ideas of Judaism, the practices of Judaism. Many who choose Judaism have come from other traditions where they felt pressure to be loyal to a certain set of values or beliefs. And they find relief in Judaism that there's room for questioning. There's a room for diverse interpretations. Now, one recent convert to Judaism wrote this, and this person is in the congregation tonight, and I'm not going to identify them, um, but I thought it was worth sharing, and if that person's here, don't yell at me. It, it's totally anonymous. It says, when I decided I wanted to convert to Judaism, it was not because I wanted to learn how to be a good person. My parents had already done a decent job of that. Rather, it was about finding a spiritual architecture a framework that could provide a deeper dimension of experience in my life. 
That framework is something I've always been searching for, and I believe I found it in Judaism. How many of us could say such a passion statement about Judaism? People, the people who convert to Judaism in our congregation have become the spiritual backbone of our community. We need to recognize that. Um, we haven't done enough of that. They worship here every week, and indeed we would not have the 10 necessary Jews for regular worship without them. And I want people who are in the, in, that are being, who are seeing this message online, I want them especially to, to, to feel this. Indeed, we would not have the 10 necessary Jews for regular worship without them. They study every week. They try to keep a Jewish home. They will show up at a moment's notice to do something that needs to be done in the synagogue. And as we look into the future, to the degree to which we bring these serious Jews into our community, will determine what the fate of our synagogue really will be. If you were to ask me the number one priority of our synagogue, um, I have no doubt. I, I, I've been thinking about this since the high holidays. Here's the number one priority. I said, become a place where more and more religious seekers discover the beauty of Judaism. If you want a definition of a success of a synagogue, that's it. If we, if you have to start with that. Let me repeat that. A place where more and more religious seekers discover the beauty of Judaism. And I'm talking our members, our Jews, or, or people who are not yet Jews, or people will never be Jewish. Discover the beauty of Judaism in synagogue. We are not a missionary tradition in any sense. We, we, need, we feel no need to convert people to Judaism because we believe that all righteous people have a place in the world to come and God does not love the Jews um, exclusively. Different people have different roadmaps to God. Let us celebrate diversity. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't share our Judaism with the world. You know, the Pew study says that 30% of the U.S. population are what called, are called religious nons. That's the term, N-O-N-E-S. Maybe I, am I pronouncing it correctly? Nons? Yeah, they're nons. I wouldn't want to be called a non, but okay. 30% of the U.S. population are nons. They are not atheist or agnostics. They, ju they just don't have a specific religious community that's compelling to them. So how many people is that? That's 90 million people. 90 million people in the United States are nons. If we believe that Judaism is compelling, which I do, and if so many people have lost connection to religion, which is a fact, and we think that a liberal faith such as ours is valuable, I think it's very valuable. I spent my life teaching it. Don't we have an obligation to share it with the world? Not in a coercive way, but in a dignified, sensitive way. Not missionizing people who have a religion. I'm happy anyone has a religion. I'll help them, I'll help them in any way I can to, in order for them to fulfill their religious tradition. But so many people have no religion, 90 million of us. And they are religiously unrooted. And I think that Judaism makes sense and will open up people to a beautiful and intellectually compelling religious path. I'll take 90 million new people in Nurfam Temple. If we have to build a new sanctuary, what the hell? Okay, uh, what percentage do we need, Becky? I mean. You tell me. You tell me. Nathan, you're not here to talk to. Nathan, how, what percentage of 90 million do we need? Very small percentage. Okay. This past Wednesday, four extraordinary dedicated Jewish seekers completed their conversion to Judaism in this congregation. Um, they worked hard. They showed their dedication. They acquired knowledge. They showed tremendous patience. And they became part of the Jewish people. And they are our assurance. And I say this without any hesitation whatsoever. They are our assurance that Judaism will never die. That Judaism is a compelling tradition. That the God who seeks a that that people who seek a connection to God can find 
beauty in Judaism. And my prayer is that we will continue to be a place where we are all welcome. And if they become enamored with Judaism, anyone who comes into the sanctuary, we will encourage them and support them. So I'd like Sarah and Tula and Deanna and Joan to come up on the beam up for a second. I'm not going to embarrass them. They're not going to say anything. I just want to recognize them, and then we're going to, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Just come, 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 come close. Come. I'm not, we're not lining you up like we're going to take a <laughs> shot at you. Come over here so we can talk. Come, come, okay. come over here. Yeah, well, let's talk. Let's talk. We're, we're friends. Um, I'm going to speak very selfishly. You've done so much for me. I mean, um, you showed me what I do matters. Each of you has showed such commitment to this incredible tradition of ours. And I have not made it easy for you. <laughs> How many obstacles have I set before you? Okay, Tula, we, okay. <laughs> the, 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 the final, the creme de la creme was, I got COVID and we couldn't do the conversion. <laughs> but you guys stuck in there because it matters to you because this is an incredible tradition that somehow you have found. No one forced you to do it. It was just because something in your heart and your soul brought you to this. And boy, are we lucky as a Jewish community for that. Boy, how lucky we are to have you as part of our community. And you, and you stand here, um, following in the footsteps of so many other of our members who have come to Judaism and embraced it through our synagogue. And you are a great blessing. And just think about it. You know, this past week, people were speaking about, um, we spoke about last week, this incredible gathering of, of Jews at, in, in Washington in, in solidarity and brought Jews all together. Some people said it was 230,000. The New York Times says it was 10,000. I mean, there's got to be a difference there. But, but 230,000 people, which represents a large percentage of, of, of the Jewish people, were only 15 million people. But the four of you are what really counts. Because, look, in this small sanctuary tonight, you are a fundamentalist, not just in terms of you're here, but what you bring to us. And my prayer is, is that um, you're going to keep on giving and you'll keep on growing. And you'll, and you know what I was talking about in my sermon. I'm not interested in missionizing people from another religion. But, you can, you, but you, the glow that you feel in Judaism, you can share that with other people. Let people know that Judaism is beautiful. Let people know that it, 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 it's, it, it's glorious and it's filled with joy and challenge and spirituality and faith. Just share that with people. Share it with our congregation. Share it with the world. Because we need people to share to the world what we're about. We're not about politics. We're not about, we're about serving God and serving humanity. Let's get the word out that that's what we're about. So what I want to do is... I'm going to put this Talid over you, so you've got to get together. And Becky and Nathan, you've got to get closer than that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put this over you, and, um, and Becky and Nathan are going to um, chant the priestly benediction. I'm, it's going over you. Okay. Okay, go. No, okay. That's good. Okay.
Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. 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 Thank you.